very much for joining our session today. My name is uh, Deji from the Bureau Indonesia, and I will moderate today's discussion, which is about the technical guidance for setting and achieving science-based targets here. Uh, this webinar is hosted by the Bureau Indonesia. Um, this is just uh, to show you some of the housekeeping notes. Uh, you, you will be remain in listen-only mode throughout the webinar, and the webinar will be recorded. The recording will be made available for the uh, following webinar and also will be sent. The, uh, they will be also emailed to you and will be posted to, in the SPDI YouTube channel. And following the presentations, the panelists will address the attendees' questions. You can submit uh, the questions anytime using the Q&A button at the bottom right of your screen right now. Or you may also send the question to my email here at dd.mahagigat at wri.org. And last but not least, many of us are broadcasting from our home because of the working from home rules. So please bear with us in case of any technical difficulties or any uh, uh, unnecessary sounds here. So this webinar is the second session of the first ever SPTI Asia webinar series for a region uh, focused discussion, guidance, and also deep dive into science target setting. Uh, this is a joint collaboration between CDP Hong Kong, WWF Singapore, WR Indonesia, Global Compact Network Malaysia, and also Global Compact Network Singapore. Last week on Tuesday, we already finished the business case for setting science strategy for this topic that we covered. And you may also revert to the YouTube channel if you want to rewatch the uh, presentations. Today's session will, uh, as I mentioned, will uh, uh, be pretty much talking about the te technical stuff of setting and achieving science-based targets. And we have also an upcoming sessions will be um, about the uh, some of the case studies on the companies who are already successful implementing the science-based target, as well as uh, the science-based target for financial institution, which will be held in the next two Tuesdays. Uh, OK, for this uh, time, I would like to share our work in WL Indonesia uh, we have a research project which is helping the companies in Southeast Asia to analyze the opportunity and challenges for scientist target implementation to the companies, but hopefully the lessons can be also leveraged to other companies in the region here. We have some initial findings here based on the data and vision loads that we may have seen in the right-hand side of the slide. One of them is the need for more technical and methodologies to submission here, which will be in line with our objectives today to really uh, get into some technical stuff. Uh, so hopefully this will also help disseminate some of the technical stuff of the sense based target and also to let you know what's actually the requirement to join to sense based target initiatives. Uh, okay, uh, I would like to also uh, acknowledge the outreach partner of the Global Indonesia. This webinar is also being supported by our outreach partner, which is Global Compact Network Indonesia. Uh, the Business for Sustainable Development Philippines, and also Indonesia Business Council for Sustainable Development. We are very grateful for the kind support to this webinar. And uh, this is the general agenda. We have three amazing speakers joining us today, which will overview the methodologies and also technical stuff of uh, the scientists I get from three different perspectives. Uh, we have John Sotong, our colleague from WRI, who will describe the criteria, process, and methodology development used to uh, validate company target submission. And we have Mark Stevenson from WWF, who will provide the update on one of the important sectors in the region, which is forex and language agriculture. She will provide the uh, project and methodology development updates. And uh, thirdly, we have uh, Kulai Basin, uh, from Sri Seman India will share the uh, experience of Sri Seman leveraging the methodologies and also the uh, guidance of science target to in line with the business in this main sector here. So I would like to start the uh, webinar by uh, uh, giving you some poll questions to know you better here. Uh, I think um, this one, these poll questions will also shown in your screen uh, here. Uh, there are three different types of question which will, uh, you know, assess how familiar you are with the sensory subject methodologies. The first question is about the greenhouse gas inventory. The second one is about the uh, greenhouse gas protocol. 
and the one about the SPDI methodology and requirement. Uh, the polling will be sub, uh, will be open for five minutes, and we will uh, share the result after the first presentation is finished. And I would like to introduce the first speaker, John Sotong from uh, WL Indonesia. He is a senior associate with the Science Research Initiative. John is managing the technical working group uh, for the uh, Science Research Initiative and has a wide range of experience in both the uh, uh, energy and also the international development here. John here will speak about the methodology development and uh, the process to join Science Research Initiative. John, you have 30 minutes and uh, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I wanted to just make sure that I can forward the presentation slides. Yep, the presentation is not advancing. You, you should have your um, presentations right. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm using the cursor. And... There we go. Let's okay, try. Okay, I, I can help you. Uh, can you see that? Oh, did you? Okay, thank you very much. Can you go to the next slide, please? Oh, thank you. So here's here's the agenda today. I'd like to just give you a quick overview of where we are at the SBTI in 2020. I'll go over some of the approaches we use with respect to science and some of the criteria that we apply as a result of the science as um, when it comes to goal setting. Um, take you through uh, joining the SBTI as well as our business ambition for 1.5C. And I wanted to go over a little bit in depth in terms of some of our methodologies, uh, in terms of developing a target and some of the tools that we offer uh, in addition to other resources that we have on the website. Next slide, please. So we've come a long way in a short period of time. Uh, just on October 8th, we had a press release that went out uh, officially uh, acknowledging the fact that we have over a 1,000 companies now globally that have set or committed to setting uh, science-based targets. Uh, over 300 of those are what we call high-impact companies, while another 700 are also part of the program. Uh, it, altogether, we've now surpassed, although this shows 200, uh, say 488 uh, approved targets, we've actually now surpassed the 500 mark. So another big milestone that the SBTI has has reached and um, given the, the capacity that exists within the four different organizations that run the SBTI, this is, this is a big milestone and, and something we're very proud of. Next slide, please. So let's just start with a very quick recap of some climate science and some of what underpins the science-based targets program uh, as we know it. On the left side, you'll see uh, just the general increase in parts per million of, of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, right now, we're around 400 parts per million and 2,100, who knows? That's up to us. Um, the carbon budget, as we refer to it, and which is also part of the underpinning of science-based targets uh, approach. Um, in the red, you see this is how much carbon we've emitted up till now, and this is how much is left in, in the, uh, the white polka dotted area. I know many of you are familiar with this, but it translates into how we <clears throat> go about setting science-based targets and defining which pathways we, we choose, the red dotted uh, line that is steeper than the blue dotted line is the 1.5C pathway. And the blue line, 
blue dotted line represents a well below 2C pathway. Those are, this is the trajectory we have to take emissions over the next 50 years. Um, and much of what uh, the uh, Science-Based Targets Program is uh, based on revolves around this slide right here. Next slide, please. So in general, how do science-based targets work? Greenhouse gas emission reduction targets that are consistent with the level of decarbonization that, according to climate science, is required to keep global temperature increase within 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial temperature levels. And how this works in practice is, one, you set your long-term goal. This is the purple line here. And you're forecasting out to, say, 2050 if you're in a 1.5C pathway. And you set along the way, you set interim science-based targets. Between within the program, we allow five to 15 year targets. And those can either be aligned with a 1.5C pathway or well below two degrees C pathway, as I mentioned earlier. And this is a general, uh, very you know, simple representation of how this would work. Three is the annual disclosure the MRV of these, of these targets, measuring, reporting, and verification of these targets as you go forward. And really, right now, as far as the program is concerned, being in its first five years, we're still in that first upper quadrant here, in the upper left quadrant with companies. Um, next slide, please. So through those basic and again, we're, because we're having a technical discussion and we have a short amount of time, we're having to <laughs> perhaps move uh, quite quickly, but rest assured all of the uh, resources and criteria and everything you might want to learn uh, is on our websites. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see our uh, sciencebasedtargets.org is the website we run. And there you can find all the information you need. But just to rump back, this is the criteria for the Science-Based Targets Program, the very general criteria for every single target that's set in the program. All company-wide scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions must be covered. There is a small exclusion of 5%, and that's in line with the greenhouse gas protocol. Uh, targets have to be a minimum of five to no more than 15 years into the future. Uh, some would say the shorter the better. Nothing focuses the attention like a deadline. Progress to date. So forward-looking ambition is very important. We, we're, we don't accept targets that have already been achieved or are near achieving. Um, and reporting, uh, we require all data and targets to be uh, disclosed publicly on an annual basis. We don't say where and exactly how you must do that, but it has to be public. And scope three. So for for every company that has emissions, scope three emissions that are 40% or more of their total combined greenhouse gas footprint, you are required to include a scope three target. So if you are a company that has scope three emissions of 38%, you are not required to set a scope three target. For anyone over 40, you must. And I'll delve a little, little bit deeper here in the next slide. So for all scope one and two targets under the SBTI, at a minimum, you either choose one of two pathways, a well below two degree pathway or a 1.5 C aligned pathway. Uh, intensity targets are eligible, but only when they lead to absolute emission reductions in line with those climate scenarios that I just mentioned. Or they fall in line with our sectoral decarbonization approach, which I'll explain later. Uh, renewable energy targets are also part of the program. So targets to source renewable e electricity at a rate that's consistent with 1.5C aligned scenarios are acceptable to scope two emission reduction targets. So you can see the specifics of 
of those, 80% by 2025 or 100% by 2030. And those track along with the science and the scenarios uh, that we see, especially with regard to the power sector. Next slide, please. So for scope three, as I mentioned earlier, if you have 40% or more of your total scope one, two, and three footprint that's coming from scope three sources, you have to include, you have to set targets that are at least two thirds of those scope three emissions. So 66.666% of all of those scope three emission sources must have a target in the SBTI. And similar to scope one and two targets, they also need to be five to 15 years. Now they are different. Scope three targets are different and there are different options, including they don't have to meet the same rigor as 1.5 C and well below two C pathway alignment that can be aligned with a two degree pathway, or there are some other intensity uh, and physical intensity uh, options that you can choose. Again, if we had more time, we could go into <laughs> greater depth of these. Next slide, please. So underpinning all of this, everything that we've talked about so far and everything that I'll be speaking about over the next few slides is that all, all companies that participate in the SBTI, all of their inventories uh, need to be in alignment with greenhouse gas protocol accounting standards. Uh, this is just an illustration of the various standards, the corporate standard, the scope two and scope three, uh, various scope three standards. But uh, make no mistake, everything that, um, that we do is underpinned by greenhouse gas protocol and our greenhouse gas accounting approaches uh, within. So that kind of transitions us to the next slide <clears throat> where we get into a little bit more nitty gritty about uh, target setting, some of the SBTI, SBT methodologies that exist. So when it comes to target setting within the SBT, we uh, the first choice is to choose an emission scenario that your company is going to to follow. Are you going to go down a, a well below two degree path or a 1.5 C aligned pathway? Those are the two options. Uh, in this presentation, I'm not going to get into net zero. I understand that that's a big uh, discussion right now, but for what it's worth, when it comes to the net zero discussion, uh, this aligns with the 1.5 C degree pathway. So all targets uh, and any company that is considering a net zero target would want to choose or would be required to choose a 1.5 C pathway. So once you've chosen your emission scenario, the question is, you know, what is my share as a company? And, and through the science, how do we allocate that carbon budget? So, there's an absolute contraction approach and an intensity convergence approach, which I'm going to explain over the next two slides. But those are the, uh, in essence, A is the absolute uh, contraction or absolute based approach, and B is a sector based approach, uh, and that is the intensity convergence for each sector. And so once you've chosen um, that pathway, you start comparing against your baseline. How much do I as a company need to reduce? What am I responsible for? Where do I sit on the, uh, with respect to uh, my sector and my uh, intensity level within my sector? Am I higher, am I lower? Am I more efficient, less efficient? What's my baseline carbon footprint? I need to know what my baseline carbon intensity is. Where my value chain, again, it comes down to scope three emissions. Uh, depending on the sector in, you're in, you, you may or may not need to include these, but more often than not, you do. And where in those, where in my value chain, my, my supply chain, are my emissions hotspots? And across which sectors do all of my activities spread? And also another important aspect of this is how much will my business grow? Depending on what sector you're in and who you are within your sector and, and what you're doing, you know. Uh, generally speaking, if you're going to be growing or 
uh, on a absolute basis or or contracting, and that depends, and that makes a final difference in the trajectory you have to take as in terms of making the sun's space token. Next slide, please. So when it comes to, I mentioned earlier, the absolute based approach or the sector based approach, target ambitions must be aligned with either of these approaches. Now the absolute based approach, anyone in any sector can make an absolute based uh, goal. And that's simply saying, my company will reduce emissions from 2020 to 2030 by 30 percent um, or by 2.5 percent annually. Uh, and that is based on, it's an equal percentage reduction based on IPCC carbon budget scenarios, which I mentioned earlier in the discussion. A sector-based approach is different. It's where every company, you see here company A, B, company C, the sector is the black line that goes through, that's the sector average. And depending where you are on the spectrum, you will have to converge to, everyone needs to converge to the same point by 2050, 2015. That's what we mean by convergence. Uh, and these are also based on sectoral IEA carbon budgets, which uh, if you're familiar with the energy technology perspectives document that is produced uh, biannually by the IEA, that is the that also underpins much of our modeling uh, for the sector-based approach. Again, I'll go to the next slide and we'll get a little bit more into detail, further detail on that. So here we are with contraction, and this is where all companies across all sectors are reducing at absolute rates all the way through to 2050. Uh, this is with the exception of the power sector because the power sector has specific requirements for uh, and expectations for um, for um, contraction and convergence uh, to 2050. Next slide, please. Thank you. And as I mentioned, convergence. Um, this is specifically around what we use again. You'll notice this SDA, this is our sectoral decarbonization approach. And I'll discuss the tool that we have for that a little bit later. But that revolves around a, a finite number of sectors for which we've defined power generation, cement, aluminum, pulp and paper, some of the heavier emitting sectors, transport. And uh, this requires more detail in terms of setting a target. Not Nothing that uh, isn't publicly available uh, already, but for companies, when you're setting your target, you certainly would have have these types of data to set a target like this. Um, but again, this is all based on the notion that all companies within a specific sector need to converge to a common point in time, which is in a 1.5C pathway at zero by 2050. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier we have a, a science-based target setting tool on our website. It's publicly available. Anyone can access it. Uh, it's very simple to use. Um, the, the options for scope one and two target modeling are, are, are very simple to choose from. You either choose the sectoral decarbonization approach, as I mentioned, the convergence approach, or an absolute contraction approach. You see in the blue on the left-hand side where you would put your inputs, and then it calculates um, what your required uh, target would be for you as a as a as a company, individual company. Uh, below here we have these options for scope three uh, modeling that I mentioned earlier. There are a couple of there are three different options that you can choose for a scope three target. They don't have to match the same requirements for scope one and two targets. But again, we have a, a tool for that that is publicly available, and I welcome all of you to go online and give it a give it a roll. Next slide, please. So I mentioned we have 
a tool, but we also have we have many tools. Actually, we have uh, I, I went through some criteria. I went through some of the science, but our our website is loaded with helpful information that can take away a lot of the uh, the questions. Uh, that we have a considerable FAQ page um, that can help answer a lot of questions for for those interested in pursuing uh, science based targets. But we have you know everything from uh, general you know foundations of those approaches to uh, more specific manuals and then we have our very specific criteria and recommendations uh, protocols that you will have to meet uh, as someone who's applying to to have a target approved within there and then we have our tools and resources which are uh, many and sector based in many cases and we're constantly trying to expand those to new sectors and uh, more impactful sectors. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier, I, th I, I thought it was important to go through just some basics of how to actually join the SBTI. And, and of course, the first step is always the hardest, uh, the committing step. And that requires, as we all know, that requires real leadership from, from within the, you know, at the top of the organization. Uh, all the way to the bottom. Uh, companies have to be ready to commit to something like this. They can't just um, say, oh, sure, we'll give it a try. I mean, it is it is a commitment, and it is uh, important that uh, companies are serious about, um, you know, when they want to join the program, that they're that they're going to achieve their their targets. So that first step is always the hardest, getting to that point where, where a company is ready to sign uh, on the line to say, Okay, we're going to put ourselves out there in the public to say we've got two years to develop a target, and that's the next stage. Uh, so you, every company has two years to uh, make sure all of their inventory data is uh, in place, and that includes scope three emissions data, which uh, what I did mention earlier is for scope three um you know, how do you know if you have 40% or more of your total scope one, two, and three footprint from scope three emission sources? Well, you have to do a, you have to do an analysis of that. So, oftentimes companies haven't done that yet, and that's what takes a, a good deal of time in this two-year period is to get their scope three sources, uh, you know, laid out and understood. And then once you've developed that target. You submit that target to the SBTI. We have a, a, a technical validation, a target validation team, where we, it is a paid service. Uh, it's approximately, I think at the moment it's around four thousand U.S. dollars, and that service pays for an initial review of the target, as well as a final review of the target, and which includes uh, some some room for feedback, some back and forth iteration. Between um, between the company and the SVTI, if needed. And once that target has been approved, then you are clear to announce that target. Um, we obviously put that on our website. You can go to our website today and see all 1,000. I think at, in my presentation I had 1,019 companies, but it's actually 1,029 companies. Um, uh, as we sit here today, and um, that's where we post your target, and then you're free to announce your target and use our uh, communication resources, et cetera. Next slide, please. So I also need to mention that about a year ago, well, just over a year ago, uh, so one of our partners through We Mean Business uh, launched a campaign called the Business Ambition for 1.5C. And this has been instrumental in getting companies to raise the level of ambition of their, not only their SBTI targets, but all of their greenhouse gas commitments to the, to the, to the level that we truly need to avoid dangerous climate change. Next slide, please. This campaign has been extremely successful, and as of October, 
We've already got 309 companies that are committed to joining a 1.5C pathway. And in fact, and that's from 49 different countries. And in fact, most of the targets that we've set this year, despite coronavirus, have been, um, our, our participation level has not dropped off given coronavirus. And, and actually the, the level of ambition that companies have been joining up to, uh, given the 1.5C campaign has been pretty remarkable. Next slide, please. And this is just some detail on how you can actually join the campaign. Similar to joining the SBTI, it's about making a commitment and actually signing on a dotted line, signing your company, actually signing a, a letter to commit towards signing a, or rather having a science-based target approved that is in line with a 1.5C scenario. Or companies are also able to make a net zero commitment. And this is obviously, you know, to no one's surprise, has been gaining more and more traction throughout the year, and we don't see it stopping anytime soon. Next slide. And thank you. I understand that is a lot of information over a short amount of period, and I'm, it's a bit breathless, but I'm happy to, to take questions and, and hopefully um, give you all answers. So thank yeah. you. Thank you, John, for your great overview. Of course, it's never enough to talk about the methodologies and maybe challenges that are out to really apply some of the methodologies here. Uh, so as mentioned by John, I suggest you to uh, refer to the tools and guidance available at the uh, SPTI website, and we will also send it over to your email as well. Before moving on, John, uh, we will show the poll result. Uh, maybe Emily can assist us. I think based on the poll results, you may see also on your own screen right now uh, that uh, the overall uh, greenhouse gas inventory is not uh, is not yet reported, but uh, some of the companies already considering to also report them. Uh, the familiarity of the greenhouse gas protocol also still uh, pretty low here, and uh, the familiarity with the census target as well, which is fine. That's why we have this session to hopefully facilitate you in some of the overview of the methodologies here. So uh, thanks for this one. This is uh, this is very uh, uh, Helpful. Maybe John can take maybe two or three questions here before we move on to the uh, next session. Uh, I have several questions that I uh, like. Maybe it will be better for you to answer live. Uh, the first one is from King Yu Ho. Apologize if I mispronounce your name. Uh, he said that uh, we have an SPDI pro target for 2022 and uh, is looking for uh, setting a new target for 2030 and beyond. Uh, so maybe the questions that I have not answered is instead of using SPA, the sector of decarbonization approach, can uh, I use the absolute contraction method of well below two degrees, which is 2.5 percent of annual reduction? Maybe that's the first question. Yes, the answer is uh, yes, you can. Uh, sounds like you, uh, if I understand the correction or sorry, the question, you have an approved target for 2022. That means. Yep. Uh, it is to be completed in 2022 and that you want to set a second target for 2030. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that is, that is absolutely uh, allowable. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, instead of using the SCA, you can use an absolute contraction method for well below two okay. degrees. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, question maybe also, maybe some of uh, the companies also uh, often ask you about the REC's or renewable electricity certificates. Does that count as sourcing the renewable energies and can be also included in the strategies to uh, be included in the census targets? Sorry, did you, I'm, I, I the missed renewable, that. Renewable energy certificates, sorry, will that be included as one of the strategies in the science-based targets? Oh, I see. I see. Uh, sorry, I was looking through the the Q and A there. Um, yeah, so uh, the use of RECs. So we, so the the best answer to that question is, folks should uh, refer to our scope two guidance. We have a market based accounting approach. 
and a regular accounting approach. And the market-based accounting approach includes instruments such as Rex or um, environmental attributes associated with power purchase agreements. And, mm -hmm. and those are uh, applicable to a scope two target. Okay. So in that case, does the company needs to uh, you know, show the uh, specific um, you know, verification of the RACs or uh, the, the, how is the requirement for RACs to be included in the uh, strategies for the census target? Yeah, I wish I had I wish I had the specifics in front of me right now, so I could ask you a question. But yeah, demonstration demonstration of of ownership uh, is is necessary. Yes. Okay. Sure. Of the uh, ownership oh, of the environmental yeah. attributes. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, maybe we can take another two before we move on. Uh, this is an interesting question from Aldo Johnson. Uh, 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 apologies if I can't mispronounce your name, about the uh, SDA for the sectoral determination approach. Does the non-performance of, say, company A put greater pressure or expectation on other companies to do more so that the sector achieves the convergence line? So maybe this is related. Uh, does the companies that not doing anything, will uh, the burden will shift to other companies or will the comp uh, all of the companies will have the same pathways regardless of other companies doing Right. So this is getting to the free ridership, free rider question of of whether or not um yeah, so each so each company when they come to setting a target will have to meet the 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 output that they that they generate. And yes, if let's say in twenty years the the slope the reduction slope is steeper because other companies haven't done their part of the work, then yeah, it does mm -hmm. mean it is a, a greater burden for everyone. Does that okay. answer the question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Basically, maybe uh, the company will responsible to, to their own here, I guess. And also, uh, because it's a sector determination approach, is that different sector will have a different uh, burden also based on the carbon budget that you mentioned. And That's then, right. The, yeah. Those sectors have different rates of decarbonization, and mm -hmm. every time, every you know, five years, when you renew the data and you look at the the remodeling, uh, mm -hmm. if that slope is if this the slope is steeper, then mm -hmm. yeah, everyone's job is more difficult. Yeah, well, we're at it. Maybe the question also about uh, when the availability for the SDA for one point five. Available then in the update that's also about that one. That's a great question. <laughs> that's a great <laughs> question. I wish I had an answer. We are currently uh so for those who, who are familiar with the SDA, as I mentioned earlier, it is it does rely on the publication of IEA's energy technology perspectives. Uh they recently just released, as of last month, a new report. Uh, however, the the scenario that they've uh, released, it's unclear if they've produced a true 1.5C scenario, and we have not seen the data yet, so we have to do some initial analysis, and then we're going to have to go on a sector-by-sector -sector basis to produce that. So that's not coming anytime soon. What we do have is we've done an initial uh, 1.5C pathway for the power sector. I see. Okay. Lastly, before we move on to the uh, next uh, presenter, I, I, I saw a lot of questions that maybe John also maybe address, but this might be worth to mention it live. So this is the question from ISAC that may be also related to some of the companies in the Asia region. So what is the best approach, John, you would recommend uh, to apply SDDI? the companies, there is a conglomerate that has many business in the different sectors here. Maybe uh, the lesson from Mahindra Group, uh, you may also share here how they handle different sectors and business in one company here. Right. So, again, this is a um, – so, one, if the, if the company is the parent company of, of many separate, you know, uh, different business lines, 
yeah, it, it makes your job more difficult uh, in that you have to model different different sectors. Um, this is where an absolute contraction approach, you know, offers a more simple pathway for, no pun intended, for for everyone involved. But um, but the modeling is more, you know, if you choose not to and you want to go down an SDA pathway, or you can, because again, the SDA pathway is not available for all sectors. Only a, a finite uh, a number of sectors you know, have an SDA pathway. Um, you may be you know, forced to do a mix of SDA for some sectors or some parts of your business and absolute for other parts. And, and that can be done. Uh, again, we have a thousand companies and um, by no means are they homogenous in nature. They're very uh, heterogeneous uh, mix of companies. So. Okay, just just to summarize, so it really depends on the companies whether they want to have a one target for the conglomerates or they want to have a separate target for the, each of the different businesses. That's what I mean. Well, they wouldn't. They wouldn't be because we do require the parent company to make the commitment. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, they they wouldn't. They wouldn't have. Let's say. Let's say they had. 13 different very distinct business lines. They wouldn't have 13 mm -hmm. separate targets. Okay. Um, we would need to do some some aggregation and some you know, complicated math to make okay. to make that clearer. Okay, makes sense. Okay, John, thank you. And I, uh, I, I can show you there are some interesting questions that you may answer it in the chat box. So uh, again, we also um, recommend you to get, to uh, put your question in the planner box. And we will move on to the second uh, speaker. Thank you, John. Uh, so before we move on to the second session, we'll open the next poll questions, which is related with the uh, presentations about the flag sector, which is for us land use and also agriculture. So you may see in your screen right now, there are two questions that addressing, the first one is the question about the green access inventory or deforestation commitment, which is whether there are assessing the amount of land use change or deforestation in your either scope one or scope three. And the second one is about the uh, land sector kind of mitigation activities within supply chain. We will open the poll for five minutes and I will also come back to this after the presentation finish. So I'll introduce you to the uh, next speaker, uh, Mark Stevenson, which is served right now as the Senior Director of Strategy and Research on the first team for WWFUS. Um, Marta leads the development of wide-ranging strategies at WWFUS, uh, especially supporting the companies and cities that uh, are creating census targets to achieve ambitious goals of sustainability for climate and, and nature. Marta, uh, the time is yours and you have 15 minutes to present. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much and good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me to speak to you today about some work that we're doing uh, for the forest, land, and agriculture sector within the Science-Based Targets Initiative, and we're calling it short the FLAG project. Um, so as, as John had said, not every sector has an SDA approach or a sector approach. Uh, and so particularly within the land sector, what we were seeing is a real gap in guidance on this particular sector. And so that's why we have taken it on to develop guidance. I've seen a few questions in the chat asking about biogenic carbon, um, and this is the place that we're addressing the gaps that we've seen here. So first, what is the, the FOLU sector? What is the flag sector? It's agriculture, forestry, and other land uses, um, as determined by the IPCC reports. And really, FOLU includes the, the former LULU CF plus greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture practice. So land use, land use change, and forestry plus agricultural emissions. And together, these represent about 24% of global annual greenhouse gas emissions. And half of those are from deforestation and forest degradation, and the other half are from agricultural emissions. These sources include, of course, CO2 coming from deforestation, uh, 
and grassland fires and loss, uh, other types of land use change. The methane is coming from enteric fermentation and also rice production. Fertilizers are emitting N2O. And then, of course, manure management is emitting both methane and N2O. So these are the major sources within the land sector of greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason we we decided we needed to provide this the sector pathway was principally a, a few reasons. One, while a significant number of companies and large companies report disclose their annual emissions within CDP, very few of them accounted for emissions from deforestation and land use change. We were also seeing that companies, as they started working kind of independently, we had companies making deforestation commitments and then having climate commitments. And as they started acting on their deforestation commitments and wanting to marry those with their climate commitments, the accounting guidance and the target setting guidance was not there in order to do so. So more companies were asking for this linkage between the two. And then there are other outside of deforestation, there are other opportunities in land sector emission reductions that we wanted to make sure we were including in target setting as this is part of what is required overall to get to 1.5. We do land sector in the special report on, cli on climate change land and in 1.5. This is one of the major sector transitions that is highlighted uh, that we'll need in order to achieve these targets. So there's two projects moving forward right now in parallel. The first is the flag project that WWF is leading. And here we're developing methods and guidance to enable the forest, land, and agriculture sectors to set science-based targets that include deforestation and other land emissions impacts. And in parallel, we also need accounting guidance. So John had mentioned the greenhouse gas protocol several times, which is, of course, the guidance that we've had for well over a decade to guide corporations in, in measuring their baselines and annually accounting and disclosing what their greenhouse gas emissions are. And there has been some agricultural guidance in the past, but we haven't had strong guidance on land use, uh, both land transformation and land occupation and management. And so the new guidance that WRI is developing now will include three new standards. One, looking at carbon removals and sequestration. The second, looking at land sector emissions and removals and the third looking at bioenergy. And these two projects have been funded together by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. So um, I just wanted to mention that this work is happening with the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. Um, Matt Ramlow and David Rich are leading this work at WRI. If you're interested in more, they've been doing um, updates as well. And But I'm gonna focus now just on the flag project for this, the rest of the presentation. So, so far to date, there's been a lot of great work done within the land sector recently. Unfortunately, we don't have the IEA reports modeling this sector specifically, so um, we're having to pull together other data sources to deliver this. And so, so far, we have done our, completed our scoping phase where we've looked at all the major data sources in the field um, that we could use to model these different pathways. We have formed a corporate consultative group so we can both understand where companies are today in their accounting and um, test drafts of our models and guidance with them through pilots that we can get feedback and make sure that the outputs will work for the companies. And we've developed a, a draft model based on uh, some of the data sources pulling those together and are testing that with companies. And also we have draft guidance that we've been testing within the consultative group as well. So to share some of the data sources that we reviewed, uh, these are the main ones that we've looked at. There've also been some individual papers here and there. But largely we're focusing on the first two, the PBL ECOFIS work done in 2017 that modeled the well below two degree pathways for 
nine specific agricultural commodities. The main issue with this is one, it doesn't model a 1.5 degree trajectory. It also did not include land use change um, or deforestation in its final issuance. And of course, it's only limited to these nine commodities. So these are areas that we're looking to make improvements on the data. And then we're also looking at the Roe et al. 2019 paper um, which looks at the full sector and the contribution to 1.5. The, the main limitation here is that it doesn't have a well below two degree pathway. So we're, so we're a bit hamstrung here in the two models modeling different temperature targets, but I'll get to that in a second. So these are the two main areas that we are focusing. There are elements of Globagri that um, we may bring in. We've also reviewed project drawdown in, in detail. The McKinsey work used a GWP 20 instead of global warming potential 100, which made it somewhat incomparable to the rest and would not be consistent with existing SBTI models. So even though that's one of the newer pieces of work out there, um, we were unable to use it for what we were pulling together. So those are some of the data sources that we've reviewed and some of the pros and cons for each of them. And based on the scoping, we've decided that we're going to actually develop two, two sets of pathways. So the first will be based on the PBL work, um, and those will be building out those commodity pathways for the nine commodities and also adding land use change to that work. And the second will be a more holistic flag sector pathway that will cover everything um, where we will look at multiple response options that companies can do. So if you were curious to see the direction that we're going, these are the reference sources that I would recommend you take a look at. The ECOFIS PBL work has an existing Excel tool that you can download. But again, because it doesn't include land use change, it's missing about half of the emissions for this sector but that will give you a, a general sense of where we're starting. I will say round wood was done in this work, so timber and pulp, and the model was very highly flawed. So we're working right now with IASA to see if we have some new spatial data layers that would allow us to effectively redo that entire model so that I don't want to promise it until I know that the spatial data is available for us to do this, but that is, that's one um, significant improvement that we're looking at making for this work. And then, as I mentioned, the row at all data um, will uh, cover a significant number of issues, land use change and improved agriculture, but also includes uh, more demand side actions like shifting diets and reducing food loss and waste. Uh, looking at soil carbon enhancements and sustainable forest management. So it broadens the set of response options that were included in the um, specific work by PBL. So this gives us a more holistic view of the sector. On the temperature target conundrum, we've had a, a meeting with WRI and CVP and WWF, the, the three main technical partners in the work around science-based targets initiative. And as you can see in the red boxes, the dark blue squares and the orange squares, so those are the, the 1.5 degree targets and the well below 2 degree targets, there's effectively a direct overlap in the uncertainty ranges. And so that tells us that the AFOLU sector is not, the, the targets won't be that different between 1.5 and 2 degree, well below 2. And so we're basically going to just keep them, keep the models the same as we have um, and not have two different pathways for 1.5 and two degrees for each, but it, instead just do one and, and then talk about how that will integrate with other existing targets in a couple of slides. So who would each use each of the pathways? So for the commodity pathways, if you are closer to the producer angle or you're a trader with a limited set, of commodities, um, then you would focus more on these commodity pathways. And they may, depending on their association or driving of deforestation, would have a steeper curve in order to, de to stop that practice 
uh, by 2030 earlier than, than maybe some other practices that would have less of an intense slope. And then for the flag sector pathway, because we're looking at more demand side actions, this would be more appropriate for companies who have a broad portfolio of different commodities, agricultural commodities or forest commodities that they're using, um, food service, food retail, grocery retail, restaurants, that end of, end of thing. So um, again, these are, will provide guidance for which companies and which sectors should use the pathways. And as, as John mentioned, um, we're, we're seeing this as some nesting. There will be, because this just covers the FOLU emissions, there's still um, energy and industry emissions that most companies will have to model as well. And so what we're imagining is that companies would just use the flag pathways for that portion of their operations in scope three, and then nest that into um, their overall target, including their fossil emissions. As I said, we've formed a corporate consultative group, and here are the companies who are engaged in that effort. So we have a mix of forest and paper products companies, food and agriculture, and food service and retail. And the, the consultative group is full. We're currently working with the individual companies to review their current baselines on land sector emissions to understand how they're currently accounting for this to make sure that the guidance that we issue will kind of pick up where they're leaving off and help them go the next step to getting um, better baselines developed. And here's where we are in the project timeline. As I said, we've developed the first model and are currently getting feedback from the consultative group on this. We'll probably do some changes to this version 1.0 model before issuing it for public consultation this spring. So um, if some of you are interested in getting involved, but seeing that the consultative group is already full, um, we will put, the, put it out for public comment and receive comments at that time. So look for that this spring. And we'll take those comments, go back and do the final model, which we will issue by the end of next year. And if you have any questions specifically for us, please email the flag email at the top. Um, and thanks so much for your time. Okay, thank you, Martha. That was a really great update. And I guess, uh, Martha, you may see there are uh, several questions that are uh, really related with the flag project that you may see in the Q&A box. And if you have any other questions, please also to the coming to the Q&A box. And uh, let me introduce to the uh, third speaker here. We have called by Bob Singh from Shreesman India. Uh, Mr. Singh has over 10 years experience and currently handles all sustainability assignment for the Shreesman, which is the third largest cement producer in India. In this case, he will share the experience of leveraging census target initiative methodologies and uh, what, what will be the strategies to reduce the emission in the sector here. Mr. Singh, over to you. You have 10 minutes to present, and I guess you, you have uh, pres presentation rights right now. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, Daddy, um, are you going to scroll my presentation or I have to project it myself? Uh, I can help you if you, if you want. Do you prefer to uh, transition by yourself? Maybe you might try. Yeah, but... Okay, just just uh, let me know if you have to um, transition that one. Okay, I, I can help you, sir, to trans uh, thank you for the yeah, so, uh, yeah. so good morning once again. Um, um, I would be talking about Shri Cement's journey on climate change mitigation. So Shri Cement is one of the uh, three largest cement groups in, in India at the moment. And 
So can we move on to the next slide, please? So shale cement is among the top three cement groups in the country with a total capacity of 40.4 million tons per annum of cement manufacturing and a power generation capacity of 702 megawatt. And that includes uh, a green power uh, production capacity of 234 megawatt. So we are having four integrated locations, uh, uh, locations where integrated units are and eight locations where grinding units are. Our total turnover is 16.22 million USD with an operating profit of 538 million USD. So on to next slide, please. So particular, um, this, these are our growth trends in the last 10 years. Um, so I have taken out CAGR for growth as well. So if you look at our absolute emissions, that is scope one and scope two bundled together, um, our absolute emissions have grown at a rate of 7.5% uh, compounded annual growth rate, whereas our cement, cement production chemist capacity grew at 12.91, and our revenues have grown at 12.62. So that shows that there were some initiatives which were in place for, for combating climate change and for bringing down our GHG footprints. And uh, since, uh, as we can also uh, relate that uh, the growth which was happening in terms of cement production and revenues was far more than the growth which has happened in terms of absolute emission increment. So, um, uh, so one of some, some of the initiatives which were already in place, uh, can we move on to the next slide? Please? So if, if we see our emission control journey, so we had set a best baseline of uh, 1990, uh, year 1990, wherein our emissions were 946 kg CO2 per ton of cement equivalent. And then we had our emission reduction initiatives come in place. And uh, that's where the, uh, the trends uh, in the past four years or five years, if I say, have not moved uh, a lot. Uh, there are some changes. That's because the changes in raw material production and uh, uh, the way the process is working. And also, if we see our cement sales in million tons, it has, it has grown steeply. So this also uh, uh, tells us that uh, there were some initiatives which we, uh, which, uh, we were having in place to control our emissions. And um, next slide, please. So some initiatives um, which are very, very important in cement industries um, to control the GHG emission. One of the biggest initiative can be improving the clinker to cement ratio. So that means clinker is one of the most energy intensive uh, product. I mean, when clinker is produced, there's a lot of coal which goes into burning. There's a lot of calculation of limestone, which happens. The temperatures are around 1600 degrees centigrade. And clinker uh, becomes to be a stable product. But the production of clinker is very, very emission intensive process. So if we improve clinker to cement ratio, we save upon a lot of emissions. So the ways to improve the clinker to cement ratio is, um, uh, is, is um, either adding fly ash while grinding clinker or adding blast furnace slag or any other possible or permissible uh, additive which is available in the market. So over here in India, mostly fly ash and blast furnace slag are used as a replacement in clinker. So some around 13 years ago, we registered our clinker to cement ratio improvisation project, a CDM project. And we could get around 4.5 million CERs from that project. Then um, there are a lot of retrofits which we do in cement industry, particularly in terms of coal burning blowers and compressors and other utility equipment. So installation of turbo blower was one of the initiatives which we have taken. And uh, since uh, this blower was fairly new in the country, no other cement plant was using it at that moment. Uh, the reason being that it was a Japanese technology and it was not well established in the Indian market, but we took this risk and we, uh, we evaluated this product from uh, our technical team did an uh, intense evaluation and found that this product can be useful and we installed it in all our cement plants. So that is where some savings have started to come. Next slide, please. Another big initiative which we had taken to uh, reduce our carbon footprint was to establish waste heat recovery system. Uh, waste heat recovery system which Shree Cement has put is uh, perhaps the largest in the world outside of Chinese cement industries. Uh, 
So, uh, so what happens here is that we capture waste heat from cement plant at two locations. One is uh, from the preheater setup, and the other one is from the thinker cooler setup. And this waste heat is again reutilized in production of power. So basically, coal is burned only once when we produce thinker, and the waste heat, which which it 55. If if we talk about how much of waste heat is generated. We can establish that around 55 to 60 percent of the heat which is given to cement plant is wasted. So if we can capture a part of it, there's a lot of savings in terms of um, in terms of both GHG emission and energy efficiency. Now the thing, what happens is like how the savings come is that um, if we were to give similar, if we were to give equivalent amount of power to cement plant by producing it through a thermal plant, it would have taken more fuel into its uh, into production and then would have given out the same power which the waste heat can do by utilizing, uh, by, you know, by just putting a system which can capture waste heat and produce and, and convert it into power. We have some data like um, cement plants are generally uh, a very fast heat um, setup wherein we do we do not have much space to do more, many retrofits, so space is constrained and then the capex is very high. And the payback periods are, uh, are quite long. There are some operational issues. We had a lot of operational issues in the past, but we could resolve them all now. So the benefits is that wasted, uh, which is otherwise wasted, um, can be utilized uh, to produce power, and which is a very good benefit. And it also saves water in the, uh, in the production process. Could we move on to next slide, please? Another initiative is utilization of alternative fuels. Um, so there are a lot of ways to get amount of calorific value in them. So if we can, do, if we can uh, set up a system where we can process these fuels and can be made compatible um, uh, to be burnt along with coal and cement plant. So uh, this is what we had done. And uh, we have used automobile industry steel sludge. We have used textile industry steel sludge. We have used industry. There are other Industries wherein we, if we could find a waste which can be compatible and have a significant amount of value, this could be utilized in our system, and this is what we had done. It's like so, and we had also uh, for for uh, because there's a lot of power heated in the system, so we had installed our captive wind and solar power plants. So uh, we have put all together having a capacity of 234 megawatt, and it approximately provides 40 percent of our supply to the plant. And there were other numerous retrofits and modifications which we had done all throughout the time. So the total investment of all these initiatives had been to the tune of around 2 million, 3 million UDs, which is quite significant. Next slide, please. So why we need science targets then? We need to go fine uh, with our energy, uh, with, our, with our emission control initiatives. But what we see is that we have had 10 years of experience, and 10 years of experience in controlling our GHG footprint. And then um, we had also made substantial investments. Our specific emissions measured per ton of cement are fairly controlled, and they are well, one of the best in the industries as well. But the thing is that we are a growing organization. In the next 10 or 20 years, our production capacities would grow. And I had said that, you know, even though our absolute emissions are growing at fairly smaller rate than our uh, production and the revenues, but still our absolute emissions are growing along with um, emissions, uh, sorry, our uh, revenues and uh, our uh, cement production capacity. So what we thought is there is now, um, you know, a quest to control our absolute emissions, and that is still ongoing. So now what we thought is that there's a need to decouple the projected production growth and the emission growth. It requires to be decoupled that the production growth would happen, but the emission growth has to taper down. So uh, this was the whole thought process before we could actually think about setting up a science-based target for Shri Cement. Next slide, please. So what was our approach? Uh, the approach was fair, like we had an internal stakeholder engagement program that was a complete drive that lasted for a few months, wherein we could 
uh, get um, inputs from our finance team, from the production people, from projects team, from cost team, from research and development, from sustainability. And there were a lot of functions which interacted. And uh, of course, uh, they also highlighted the challenges that we would face uh, while, while we are actually implementing science-based targets. Um, what we thought of the whole idea that from my perspective is, is that you know, setting up a target and communicating it to people can be one aspect of setting science-based target, but we have to comply with the target in the stipulated timeline. And that is where the major challenges are going to come. So we followed a sectoral decarbonization approach um, where when we had, we saw how cement sector is going to grow in the, in the future and how much of cement sector's contribution would be there in the carbon budget. And that is where we thought like, how much can our contribution be in terms of bringing down our GHG emissions. Then we reviewed our growth strategy and target. How are we going to go? How much of capacity are we going to place? How much of capacity um, is going to be really um, uh, coming into production in the coming few, uh, uh, in the coming time? And where these uh, new capacities would be placed and sort of things, we reviewed the entire strategy and our targets. And, uh, so um, this is how uh, that was the thought process of uh, setting up a target, which we, which we have to see that it realizes in 2030. Uh, so estimation, estimating emission linked to production growth. So how much of emissions would happen if the growth happens as per the laid out strategy, and then arriving arriving to emission reduction targets. What all technologies would be available to meet the target? How much feasible the technologies? would be if we are discussing them now, because some of the technologies which are there in market are already there, but they have not been tested in all the sectors. So that these are these were the, the brainstorming things that we had in our internal engagement program and in our strategy to devise a science-based target. And more importantly, the mindset. What are the expectations of management? Are they still thinking that these the investment that they would do in mitigating climate change would be based on ROI model, or they can absorb, they have the tolerance to absorb some expenses as well. Because the thing is that, um, uh, as I mentioned, that some of the technologies would now be tested. Um, there can be technologies which are not giving results which are expected from those technologies. So in that case, there can be some expenses which have to reflect back on PNL. So, um, the mindset, I mean, this is what uh, I emphasize upon, is this, or it can be true to any company as well, wherein like, what is the expectation of yours from a science-based target and the investment that you're gonna make? You want it to be giving you return all the time, or you are ready to to, to um, have some expenses to be, um, you know, put on your p &L statement. Next, please. So some of the convincing points that we used in, in setting, up, setting up of science-based targets was that um, the company would become more innovative because these targets are more ambitious and endeavor to achieve these targets um, in, in the timeline that we have um, um, told, uh, uh, disclosed would be very, would require a lot of innovations to come in. There are technologies which are which are which seems to be promising, like carbon uh, capture and storage, but they have not been tested in in the industry as well uh, with with, uh, with the efficiency that we require from these technologies. So, if we do it, there will be a, a good quest of innovation coming here. Secondly, um, we would be more collaborative because if there is any innovation which would happen or a breakthrough that would come in terms of technology, there will be a lot of collaboration which would happen with the suppliers or um, uh, with the technology providers or R&D institution. And that is where uh, uh, there is a chance to grow. Partnership in the development of technologies and gaining the early movers advantage was also one of the thought process before we could adopt these um, science-based targets. And uh, um, uh, of course, climate change is a big criteria in making investment decisions today. Um, I also represent um, ESG related risk and investment uh, decisions. So um, um, I have seen that there's a growing concern in the past three or four years. A lot of investors, a lot of global investors have started coming and started particularly asking about how our ESG performance is. So climate change is a very big criteria. And if we are setting up some science-based targets and showing them some improvement, 
it would definitely give us some credibility in the investment market as well. And then uh, we are also building our stakeholders' confidence. Um, uh, cement uh, as a commodity has a lot of customers. Our customers may be um, uh, the simple uh, customer who wants to uh, build their houses or do some, some construction work, and whereas the customers can be as big as a very good, very, very big builder who has more expectations in terms of how the building is going to be. Um, is, is it going to be climate-friendly building, or is it going to be having all the sustainability aspects in it? Um, and there are other customers, like um, customers like government, um, uh, suppliers, investors, bankers, NGO, or any other directly related party. And sitting and communicating science with targets are helping us gaining an advantage over the peers. Next, please. So what is our target and what is the future approach? So we have committed to reduce our scope one GHG emissions by 12.7% per ton of cementitious product by 2030 from a baseline of 2019. And we also have committed to reduce our scope two emissions by 27.1% per ton of cementitious product within the same time frame. And uh, what are the future approach and expectations? So one thing that I said that, of course, I mean, improving this clinker to cement ratio would be very, very essential in controlling the GHG emissions in the cement plant because um, in the clinker manufacturing, uh, sorry, clinker production, there is a process, there is a step which comes, which is called a scalfination, and that is very, very emission intensive step where the limestone, when heated at a very high temperature, cracks down into carbon dioxide and CaO, which is calcium oxide. So this is where the most of emissions are happening. So if we are not having any alternate raw material to replace limestone from the system, calcination-related emissions can never be controlled. So how can the calcination-related emissions be controlled? One of the technologies that we have thought and we have discussed with our suppliers is carbon capture and storage. So uh, what can happen is this, this, these systems can be put where the calcination happens and the CO2 which is being liberated can directly be captured and stored, but the, the feasibility of this carbon capture and storage has to be explored. Another thing is that it has to come with cost efficiency and global acceptance. Any technology, carbon capture and storage is most discussed once so I'm putting its name here, but there can be other technologies as well. Now, um, usage of alternative fuels, uh, one of the other source of emission from cement industry is burning of coal. So if we can uh, replace some part of coal with alternative fuels, and uh, this, is, this can be one of the approach, but the expectation is that these alternative fuels should be available in the coming years. Today, um, also we are using carbon uh, alternative fuels in our system. But the but the but the, the replacement uh, percentage is only approximately two to three percent, which we want to take to five percent, provided that there is that there is a lot of availability of alternative fuel, physical for cement industries. Then another feature that we are focusing upon is um, energy efficiency, which is because cement is again a very energy intensive process. So if we can control on the energy footprints, we can actually control on our GHG emission footprints also. So um, this is all from my side. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm open to questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Mr. Singh. Um, now I will invite all speakers to um, the Q&A session. But before that one, I will share the poll results that already been submitted, the second poll results. So as you may see, um, maybe this is, will be relevant to Mark also that um, most of the answers are not currently tracking the diagnosis inventory related to the uh, line misery deforestation. And I think you may see also that the, some of the activities uh, related to that one. This will be really helpful in terms of us uh, also, Marta, in the flight project, hopefully. So the first question maybe I would like to address to Marta. Uh, I think there are specific questions about this one practically. So, how is actually the geographical context play in the development of the uh, black project here? Because you mentioned several of the stakeholder, uh, uh, you know, stakeholders that will be involved, and also several of the alignment also with the development of the greenhouse gas protocol methodology. So, how the different geographical context will play also in the land use and also flag methodologies in general? 
Sure. So we were sort of, um, I think it's a really interesting time to be looking at land sector emissions because in climate generally people talk about because there's global mixing of gases that therefore um, that climate emissions are non-spatial. But when you get to the land sector, obviously these are very spatial. And, and we're trying to retrofit some work into a system that has not really recognized the, the spatial explicitness of these, of these realities. So it is difficult. We, in a meeting with the other SBTI partners, we, I guess if you look at the PBL Netherlands work, which I would encourage folks to take a look at, they actually divide the pathways, they provide pathways for 26 different um, regional, specific regions globally. And originally we were going to see if we could build on that work, but because all of the other methods are global, um, the, the other partners preferred that we keep it very limited. So we're looking at possibly doing two geographic uh, pathways under flag, but again, figuring out not just from a development perspective, but also from a cultural perspective, how to draw those lines is going to be really tricky. So one of the things we're going to, to work on is to see if we could kind of divide the world up into two geographies and see if the pathways are meaningful. The difference is going to be in intensity in some regions with land use change driving in other regions. So I'm curious to see if it ends up canceling things out. So that's that's work to be done, but we've been kind of instructed not to go too detailed because that would be very inconsistent with everything else that's that's available. Okay, sure. Thanks, Martha. And the next question will be for Mr. Singh here. Uh, the question from Amar Jill. Uh, uh, does the company, uh, in this case, through Cement, see prospects of significant absolute reduction in greenhouse gas over the next 10 years? versus the company's plans for business growth. I think it's related with uh, how to maintain your emission being reduced while also uh, maintaining the business growth. Uh, Mr. Singh, please. Um, so, um, yeah, over the next 10 years, we are quite confident that we are going to reduce our emissions, uh, though the company would still grow at the rate that it is, it is growing now. Um, uh, the major focus that we would have uh, would be on the technologies for um, uh, having energy efficiency in place, one thing. Secondly, we would focus upon clinker to cement ratio. Uh, currently, um, the Indian market um, is having um, a limit of 35% replacement of clinker with fly ash. Mm -hmm. But we are also uh, trying to uh, ensure that, um, you know, this, this limit can be, uh, we are doing experiments trying to find out like how much of product uh, or how much of clinker can be replaced. So such initiatives are going to develop in future and we are quite confident about it. We, uh, we are more confident about uh, the waste heat recovery systems uh, would become cost effective. And uh, because today uh, the per megawatt generation cost of uh, these system is coming to around um, some 900 uh, um, million, sorry, some 9 million uh, per megawatt generation. So, um, so uh, this is uh, this is what uh, is the expectation that these costs would come down in the future, and. Uh, and if the cost come down, then there's a lot of a lot of um, uh, you know um, opportunities for a cement manufacturer to set these uh, uh, waste heat recovery plants up, and uh, and uh, this could also help in reducing your carbon footprints. And one more um, uh, uh, most feasible technology that we are seeing is that we would replace all our uh, coal-based captive power plants with renewable energy power plants. And that is where a lot of savings can happen in terms of um, uh, getting to uh, reduce our GHG emissions. So um, going forward, yeah, in 10 years of timeline, I see a lot of technologies developing and contributing to reducing GHG emissions. And uh, if we look into our, our past, um, we had been able to control our emissions, but with these new technologies, we would definitely be able to reduce the emissions as well. 
So, um, so the whole target that has been taken, um, the science-based target which we have adopted, is more linked to um, how the technologies are going to grow, how are how is Sri cement going to grow, and um, what is the end result that we can achieve with both the growth trends going in a similar direction. So um, uh, this is what it is. Okay. Thanks, uh, Mr. Singh. And for the next question, I will go back to John. Uh, I think there are several uh, questions that addressing about the um, the offsets in the uh, sensitive targets, which is uh, not really uh, cannot be included in the overall strategies. Can you elaborate more why offset is not included and maybe the relation to the uh, some question about the net zero uh, uh, sensitive target also developing right now? Uh, sure. So, yeah, currently SVTI um, and, and never has allowed offsets to be used to meet uh, science-based targets. Uh, one of the primary reasons for that is the differences in, in greenhouse gas accounting. So, for those of you who are familiar with the accounting around offsets versus the greenhouse gas inventory, they're two separate and distinct uh, activities. One uh, is project-based, so the uh, calculating uh, offsets is based on a hypothetical counterfactual baseline, um, and what and the additional emissions that uh, would not happen as a result of the project. Whereas greenhouse gas accounting of you know greenhouse gas inventory is you know, that you're dealing with specifics. You're dealing with an actual baseline and uh, reductions or increases. Um, and those are two separate accounting types and they don't necessarily translate to one another. And therefore, the greenhouse gas protocol has never advocated for using or applying greenhouse gas offsets directly to a greenhouse gas inventory. And that's the same for the science-based targets mission. Okay. And Thanks, more, more so, the more the most the the bigger point is that science based targets initiative is is focused on reducing you know internal uh, emissions, uh, whether it's through efficiency or mitigation projects, et cetera, uh, internally. That decarbonization uh, starts at home, and and that has to be the priority for everyone in every sector. Great. Thanks, John. I hope it clarifies some of the uh, questions about the offsets. And maybe the next question for Marta, I think you mentioned about the SPT network, and maybe you could elaborate more, Marta, how the SPT network differs with the SPT initiatives in the, uh, that focuses more on the climate. Building on all of the success that has been achieved within the Science Based Targets Initiative for Climate, um, several of the same NGOs plus additional NGOs, there's about 30 different organizations involved in it now. Um, the Science Based Targets Network was formed a couple years ago to develop targets, so guidance and targets for biodiversity, land, oceans, and fresh water, picking up on some of the context-based water targets work that's been done. We just uh, issued initial guidance in mid-September during Climate Week. Uh, if companies are interested in looking at what nature targets um, could be, obviously we already have water targets out there, deforestation targets out there, some ecological integrity targets, um, but we're trying to pull it all together um, and make them science-based, which they haven't been in the past, and really uh, where I referenced before the need to get spatial and land sector for climate, all of these targets will be spatially explicit, which um, I think will be a real improvement to addressing some of these gaps in the differences between geographies in the past. So, um, yeah. If you guys are interested, again, the Science Based Targets Network, there's a website including the, the initial guidance. You could take a look at it um, and get involved. Yes, sure. And we'll definitely also maybe could share some of the words in the SPD network when we share the recording as well. So um, I guess we are running out of time. Maybe we can take one more question specifically for Mr. Singh here. 
Because I think uh, maybe you mentioned about the importance of the uh, internal buy-in to set the census target. So can you elaborate more whether the process is a bottom-up approach or whether it is a top-down approach from the uh, high-level management? How was the approach? Uh, it was more of a here at this this uh, I, I would I would say that the uh, senior management was aware about the things and. Uh, um, but the initiatives were discussed internally before, and uh, that is where we made a consensus to go and talk to senior management and convince them. But uh, uh, the, I would not say there is a clear demarcation of bottom-up or top-down approach here, but because the thing is that the senior management was already aware of what science-based targets are, what can be the benefits, and uh, we, on a ground level, had done a lot of work wherein we could find out like what all technologies would be there, how the things can work out, which function is going to have what responsibilities, and uh, what are the expectations from each function, so that we, we were very clear about before we took the proposal for approval. Secondly, as I had mentioned, um, it is all about mindset. I mean, how are we going to work on this? Um, uh, if the finance says that I am investing something, I need a return on it, and the R&D says that no, the return is not always possible. There can be some expenses always. So that mindset has to be absorbed in an organization uh, because we are talking about an ambitious target. I mean, as we had been saying all this while, that these targets are a little ambitious than the normal ones. In the normal target setting, we know what we are doing and how much we can do, and then we set a target. But over here, the thing is that we look into a carbon budget, which is completely a different perspective from an you know, industry as a whole. I mean, if I am sitting and doing some work at Chile Cement, I may not be knowing what is the entire budget of industry over at some place. So uh, this is this was more of an ambitious approach. And uh, uh, so over here, uh, the mindset plays the most important role. If the production guys, the finance guys, or R&D, or marketing, all the teams work in the same direction, and looking at the target, uh, things can be uh, can be achieved. So this was about the internal stakeholder process, and uh, um, yeah, that's pretty much it from my side. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Singh, and uh, apologize. We have so many interesting questions so far. More than 50 questions we got, but uh, due to the uh, limited time, uh, I would like to thank all speakers. Uh, thank you, John, Martha. Uh, for joining very late uh, from the U.S., uh, thank you all for Mr. Singh to uh, uh, to join us today. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, we will send all of the slides, recording, and also we will uh, compile all of the unanswered questions and send to you as uh, in the registered emails here. So, in the capacity of our co-organizers here from City of Hong Kong, uh, WWL Singapore, WIG Indonesia, GCN Malaysia, and GCN Singapore, we really appreciate your time to join our discussion today and please keep an up, uh, keep an on the lookout for the remaining two webinar series which will be about the case studies and also uh, for a specific session about the financial institution. So I will close the webinar. Thanks everyone. Stay safe and stay happy. Thank you.